we covered uh, the definition of data which is collection of variables we talked about data collection on whom and if you are collecting data on the correct correct representative study population it can be applied to the target or the source population and that is called as external validity we characterize the summed up the characteristic of good data collection comprehensive precise and valid we told you about variables categorical variables like name like blood groups if there are only two values for a variable let us say pass fail then that variable can be called as binomial then we talked about 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus pain where one group is higher than the other but they are really not numbers so this was called as ordinal variable then we talked about numbers and they are discrete numbers like numbers in the class can be 5 or can be 6 but cannot be 5.5 the other variables other numeric variable is continuous variable like temperature where fractions can be calculated 98.4 temperature it can be 0.427 that way so fractions possible means continuous fractions not possible means numeric discrete then we were we said this many or 9 out of 10 so here there is a denominator so this becomes with a denominator this becomes a ratio variable so ratio means relative frequency in the study population 9 out of 10 in this class passed and that will become the probability in the target population that means if 9 out of 10 passed this year relative frequency then 90 out of 100 will pass next year so this is the probability so now after the data collection we start dealing with data analysis and first we start dealing with numeric and continuous variables so for example this is the patient 1 1 2 3 4 5 6 so we write six year <coughs> so these numbers will have a central tendency and that let us say if the central tendency is 4 then the numbers will be dispersed around the central tendency so for example this 2 would be 2 away from 4 and 3 will be only 1 away from 4 so they will be dispersed around it so how do we calculate the central tendency a three ways mean median and mode and the dispersion dispersion can be a range 2 to 5 2 to 11 it can be interquartile range when 20, when we have an interval this number to this number x to y and 25% of the numbers are below it and 25% are above it 
So this is called as interquartile range. Then we can have confidence intervals. Again, two numbers where 95% of the total values, 95% would lie within this range and only 2.5% may be higher and 2.5% lower. So this is called as 95% confidence interval. And then we have talked of standard deviation in which the values within the range are 68%. So, so we will deal with this. How to calculate central tendency, mean, median and mode and how to calculate standard deviation and confidence interval and concepts of interquartile range and range. So, now the central tendency. The first thing is mean. So, sum up, sum up these numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 11 comes to 30. Numbers n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Put 6 here and therefore 30 upon 6 becomes the mean. So 5 is the mean here. Mean is equal to sigma xi upon n. Okay. Now which are the central numbers? The central numbers 2 above 2 and 3 are above 4 and 5 and 5 and 11 are below them. Central numbers are 4 and 5 and the mean of 4 and 5 is 4.5 which is the median. Then the number with the highest frequency, so all numbers are only once except 5 which is 2 times. So the number with the highest frequency that means 5 is the mode. Now we start talking of dispersion. How are other values in the column dispersed around these central tendencies? This is called as dispersion. For example, how far is 2 from 5? Minus 3. 3 from 5? Minus 2. So this column is called as deviation. It will have minus values and it will have plus values. To take off this sign, we will square it. So this is dispersion square, d square. All right. And then we sum up this, the dispersion square. All right. And the sum of this sum comes out to be 50. And then we take the square root of 50, which comes out to be 7. So this standard deviation is Standard deviation is equal to square root of sum of squares upon n. So this is standard deviation. So now your point estimate. We are starting to talk about that if the mean in this table was 5, then the mean in the target population should also be 5. Mean is 5 here. So the mean in the target population should also be 5. That's what we are trying to say. So supposing this is the cloud. This is the parameter. This is what we are try trying to estimate. And let us say the the mean of, if you would have taken the whole population, the mean would have been, let us say, 5.2. And by your study population, you took out a population from this, which was the study population. And here you found, found the mean was 5. So this, if you say that the mean of this was 5, you would be in an error of 0.2. This is like a rifle bullet, it may miss the bird. So you convert this 5 into an interval. How wide should be this interval? 
so one is one way is this is this is called as point estimate and then you convert it into an interval estimate so if it is a standard deviation standard deviation that came out here was 7 so you can add the standard deviation to get the upper limit and you can subtract the standard deviation to get the lower limit so from minus 2 to 12 there will be 68 percent of the sample values will lie between between these two intervals if the distribution is normal and if you so mean plus minus 1 sd will be equal to 68 percent will be 68 percent and if you multiply this standard deviation by 1.96 and then do plus minus 95 percent of the values in a normal curve will lie between the two upper and lower limits of the confidence interval so this will be called as 95 percent confidence interval and if this becomes 3 sd 3 standard deviation then 99 percent of the values will be between this so here is the central tendency 5 central tendency 5 minus 7 goes minus 2 to 12 68 percent of the area under the curve or 68 percent of the study population will lie between minus 2 to plus 12. so this is so if the curve is normal that means around the central tendency the frequency will be decreasing in a symmetrical manner so if this curve is normal and it has a normal kurtosis which means this this length from year to year is twice the length height so this is normal kurtosis 2 upon 1 then 68 percent of the area under the curve will be between mean plus minus standard deviation and if it becomes 1.96 standard deviation that means it becomes twice of this somewhere here then 95 percent values will be between these two and if it becomes three times standard deviation then 99 percent so this is the relation between the x-axis and the area under the curve in a normal curve now this curve is skewed it is not normal and this skewed, skewed curve if the curve is skewed you transform this data and if you transform it say you transform take the log values then the curve tends to normalize so if you are starting to compare two curves and you want to find out the significance of difference between the central tendency of the two distributions you will subtract mean of one from mean of two so this is the magnitude of difference and if you want to find out the significance of difference then you will have to find out find out what is the proportion of the intersection area as compared to total area under the two curves this intersection probability means that here the person can belong both to a curve and b curve so the magnitude of difference magnitude of difference can be found out by comparing mean mean 1 to mean 2 this is the magnitude of difference and the significance of difference is 
what is the proportion of area bit of intersection as compared to the total area of the curves now that value is called as p value called as p value supposing it is 0.23 that means 23% of the people of both populations combined population will be in the area which can belong to the two curves and if it is becomes less than 0.5% 0.05% that means only there is 5% of intersection and that means there is a very small chance that you will fall in an area where you can be classified as a and b that means that the difference will become significant significant now after con this concept of intersection probability we will talk of how to determine this p value so this is the algorithm this is the algorithm which tests to use to determine p value in different situations so if the curves are normal and the sample size is greater than less than 30 we use student t test if there are normal curves and the sample size is greater than 30 we use z statistics if the curve is skewed skewed is diagnosed by something which is called as barlow test and skewness is indicated if the p value is less than 0.05 then this is called as barlow's test of homogeneity then the first thing is first principle is that you use median not mean and the second thing is that you use either normalized transform to normal curves and then use the above test or you use wilcoxon test to calculate sign test or rank test to calculate the p value or you use kruskal wallace statistics now we'll talk about a situation where the one data blood pressure after is dependent on blood pressure before so this case one has blood pressure before was 90 and after was 70 and this difference was produced let us say by a anti hypertensive drug so the difference is 20 and in each case you keep on calculating the difference and if the difference is zero or the 95% confidence interval of the interval 95% confidence interval of the difference contains zero then the difference is statistically not significant p value will be more than 0.05 so here you calculate the mean difference mean of the difference and that is plus 15 and if you calculate the standard deviation of this that comes to be 6.32 multiply the 6.32 for the 68% ci or convert the 6.32 into by multiplying it by 1.96 so that it become 95% confidence interval then mean of difference plus minus 1.96 times standard deviation you get these values and since the lower value of this 15 in between lower 2.62 higher 27 
and still you have not reached zero. That means that there is difference, the difference between before and after is statistically significant. So this is what I have said, 95% confidence interval and this test is called as paired t-test because the before and after reading is on the same person. Now, if you want to compare more than two groups, given treatment A, B or C, then the method of deriving the p-value is ANOVA or analysis of variance. Now, if you are comparing frequencies, how many people, how many of the alcoholics had accident? So, 60 upon 100 starting to compare ratios 60 upon 100 had alcoholics had accident and only 30 out of 100 non alcoholics had accidents so supposing you are starting to compare these frequencies in the cell 60 upon 100 30 upon 100 then the first way is that 60 upon 100 had accident, 30 upon 100 didn't. So there is a two times higher risk of accident if you, have, if, you are, if you have had alcohol before you drive from Lucknow to Sitapur. And this is called as relative risk. There can be relative odds also. You can compare 60 upon 100 to 30 upon 100. Or you can compare 60 upon 40 and 30 upon 70. Okay. So that will be odds. Risk is 60 upon 100. And 60 upon 40 is odds. Here you find that the denominator does not contain the numerator in odds. But in risk... The denominator contains the numerator. Therefore, risk can never be more than one. Okay. So, now, how to calculate the significance of p-value? So, this was the table 60 upon 40, 30 upon 70. And if you put the marginals, the totals, 60, 30 form 90, 40, 70 form 110 and these two marginals are 100 and the total number here is 200. So, these are marginals. So, these are observed values. 60, 40, 30, 70 are observed values. And you can cal calculate the expected value in this cell. The expected value will be mean of the row total and Row total is this and column total. So, between 100 and 90 will be 95. Same way in this cell, it will be difference between 100 and 110. Alright. So, mean of 100 and 110. So, you calculate expected values in each of the four cells. Then you subtract observed minus expected. You subtract the observed from expected and you get these values. And then to take off the sign, you square, you square these values. And then you say sum of squares. So sum of the observed minus expected square upon n minus 1 and this will give you the chi-square. And from the chi-square table, you can calculate the p-value. Now, one rule here is that if the expected, if the observed value in any of the cell is less than 5, is less than 5, is less than 5, then you will use the Fisher's exact test. So, up to here today, 